it's Thursday and it's 10 a.m. in Lagos, Nigeria. That means it's time to do serious business. And it happens here on Business Morning here on Channel Television. I'm Ini John McQuay. You're welcome. We start off with oil prices which rebounded on Thursday amid dollar weakness and as investors emerged to buy dips after two sessions of steep losses, though economic concerns capped recovery. Brent crude futures had climbed 75 cents to $78.59 a barrel, while U.S. West Texas intermediate crude futures rose 77 cents to $73.61 a barrel. Big declines in the previous two days were driven by worries about a potential global recession, especially since short-term economic signs in the world's two biggest consumers, that's the United States and China, appeared shaky. Brent's and WTI's cumulative declines of more than 9% on Tuesday and Wednesday were the biggest two-day losses at the start of the year in 1991, and that's according to Refinitiv Icon data. Still staying in the global space now, but in uh, wheat or the grains, U.S. wheat and corn futures set two-week lows yesterday as concerns about weakening demand hung over commodity market. Wheat futures face additional pressure from the availability of low price supplies from the Black Sea region. Ukraine's efforts to increase exports under the Black Sea grain deal with Russia are focused on securing faster inspections of ships and most actively traded with features ended down 30 cents at $7.45 for half a bushel at the Chicago Board of Trade. The session low was its lowest since the 19th of last month at $7.44 for a quarter of a bushel and most active corn features slid to 16 for three quarter cents to settle at six dollars 53 cents for three quarters of a bushel and touched their lowest since december 21 at six dollars 52 cents for half a bushel it was a setback after the contract on friday reached an eight week high of six dollars 85 cents a bushel soybeans uh, fell by eight three quarter cents at to finish at fourteen dollars eighty three cents for half a bushel after rising in the overnight trading session on concerns of a severe drought in Argentina. Traders know that sliding crude oil prices and fund selling added pressure to grain and soy features. Well, let's come back home to Nigeria. Yesterday was a busy day. The federal government, uh, we did see the Minister of Finance give a breakdown of the 2023 budget. The federal government expects to fund that budget from mostly domestic borrowings, uh, which is estimated to give about 7.09 trillion naira from the deficit of 11.34 trillion naira. Uh, this implies that the capital market does have uh, to be strong enough to withstand this pressure. We'll delve into that in a couple of minutes. But first, let's see the breakdown of the 2023 budget. 24 hours after President Mohamedou Buhari assented to the 2023 Appropriation Act, the Minister of Finance and the company of some key government officials have gathered here to give some insights to the document. You can do better. First, the Director General of the Budget Office reminds Nigerians that the nation has enjoyed a January to December budget cycle in recent times, and he promises to ensure transparency in the implementation of the 2023 budget. We changed, greatly changed the format of the budget to provide detailed information on the revenue side of the budget, which either to used to simply reside in a schedule to the budget, in the fiscal framework schedule. And so I really would, you know, like to encourage us to make the discussions around the 2023 budget more about you know, revenues. The Minister of Finance then Please takes the stage, the highlighting the country's 2022 budget performance amidst global shocks. The nation's revenue performance as at November 2022 stood at 6.5 trillion naira, representing 87% of the set target of 7.8 trillion naira for the year. An analysis of the key contributors to the revenue collection, according to the Minister of Finance and Planning, includes a 586 billion naira collection from the federal government, customs 15 billion naira, 
independent revenue collection 1.3 trillion naira as well as a 3.7 trillion naira collection from other sources of revenue top sectors that contributed to the growth of the economy in 2022 include agriculture information and communications technology trade manufacturing with oil and gas contributing just about 5.6 percent me i'm for this administration this the minister also speaks on government's plans to remove fuel subsidy by the month of june the projected fiscal outcomes in the 2023 budget is based on petroleum subsidy reform ratio and that is to say in the 2023 framework we had assumed and the national assembly had approved that the petroleum subsidy will remain up to the middle of 2023 based on the 18 months extension announced early in 2022 in this regard only 3.36 trillion has been provided for for pms subsidy in the 2023 budget some of the parameters for the 2023 budget includes an oil price benchmark of 75 dollars per barrel Gross domestic product growth is projected at 3.75% in 2023 compared to 4.39% and economic growth expected to moderate to 3.30% in 2024 before picking up to 3.46% in 2025. The overall budget deficit is 11.34 trillion naira, representing a 5.03% of GDP. The deficit is to be financed mainly by borrowings from foreign and domestic sources, as well as privatization proceeds, which is estimated at 206 billion naira, amongst others. At 6.31 trillion, debt service is 29% of total government expenditure. At 6.31%, debt service is 29% of total government expenditure. This is 71% higher than the estimate for 2022 and it includes interest repayment of 1.2 trillion for the civilian overdraft that is popularly called the ways and means the 2023 appropriation act is the last budget by the president buhari administration the government is promising to reflate the economy to withstand the effects of a likely global recession projections by the international monetary fund imf that's right uh, we have that deficit of more than 11 trillion naira and out of that 7.04 trillion naira is supposed to come from domestic borrowing that means that we must have a strong capital market that's why we have the investment security bill and is intended to make the capital market stronger so we have the chairman of the House Committee on Capital Markets joining us now from our Abuja studio. Uh, that's Honorable Babangida Ibrahim joining us there. Uh, good morning, Honorable Ibrahim. Thank you so much for your time. Good morning. So I must say, is it congratulations that we now have at least a working document for 2023? Now to make it work is what we are looking for. And thank God we have this bill that's supposed to strengthen the capital market because if the federal government is turning to the capital market for more than 7 trillion naira, which is major out of the 11 trillion naira deficit, then of course the capital market has to be strong enough to accommodate that. It has ceased. Can you hear me, Honor Ibrahim? Yeah, I, I can hear you now. Okay, all right. I was asking. The line went up. Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, I was asking of how we can make the capital market strong enough to be able to accommodate this expectation from the federal government to get more than seven trillion naira this year to fund the budget through domestic borrowings. You see, uh, that is the more reason why. We, we, we sponsor a bill to refill the existing acts, uh, the Investment and Security Act 2007. If you remember, this act was passed during uh, President Umar Musa Adwa in 2007. And uh, you see, immediately after the passage of the act, there was a global financial crisis. And uh, after the global financial crisis, it was obvious that there is a gap in the regulation of the capital market all over. 
Uh, for that reason, uh, this act, existing act, has to be refilled. Uh, one of the major reasons why we refill the act is to provide a stronger regulatory power to, to Security and Exchange Commission. Uh, to the extent that uh, when you give them more power, at least, number one, they can perform an effective oversight in public quoted companies. Uh, and number two, it will also allow it to strengthen it is tentacles, especially with regard to most of the new development in the capital market. Uh, for example, you see, if you, if you notice that the commodity ecosystem was not regulated before now, uh, so there's uh, commodity exchanges operating now, uh, which they need to be regulated. There are also uh, new schemes that are coming up which were not there during the passage of the initial act like the regulation of ponzi schemes the regulation of derivatives and uh, a lot of other uh, new development in the capital market so this is the essence why we need to repeal this act to strengthen the power of the sec in order to perform effectively at the same time to also build uh, investors confidence to the extent that a lot of people will come to the market and invest, and it will make the market stronger to be able to provide all the needed funds. So what new is this ISA bill? What's it bringing? Because it's repealing an ex existing one. So what new is it bringing on board? You see, like I said earlier, you see, when you remember what the Minister of Finance was saying about funding, uh, by the budget, the budget deficit through uh, look uh, debts. You see, you you realize that one of the areas why we emphasize is the issue of borrowing by of nationals, like the federal government, state government, and and the local government can now go to assess the capital market easily and raise money there. Uh, like I said earlier, also uh, on the issue of uh, strengthening the power. Of the uh, of the sec, that is why it is now an affairs regulatory body of the capital market. Uh, at the same time, you see uh, the, the 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 act also provide for the commodity exchanges. The appropriate pricing and trading of commodities in Nigeria will also assist. If you remember uh, when the capital market was initially established, we only have Nigerian stock exchange. And that stock essence was only trading in equities. But now the market is beyond trading on equities. It also includes the, the trading of uh, the sourcing of debt and also management of funds. So there are a lot of products that have been traded in the, in the, in the exchanges now. And we have about four to five exchanges now. And with the commodity exchanges, I believe a lot of exchanges will come in the pipeline. So um, we do have, uh, I mean, do, the year started for us here on Business Morning with the conversation on the finance bill, which, of course, is guiding the implementation of the 2023 budget. And uh, even the Minister of Finance did refer to it when you talk about the revenue that the government is expecting through taxes. This, uh, a lot of people think, is becoming burden, a burden to investors so in the face of this, how do you hope to boost investment into the capital market when it seems like investors are being discouraged because we have new taxes being added to the burden they're already bearing? You see, uh, when you look at tax, taxes are mostly on profits. So it doesn't discourage investors. You see, one taxes are because the only aspect of... Uh, the finance bill that uh, cover the capital market is the issue of uh, capital gain on shares. Uh, a lot of people have raised concern that this will discourage investments, but I don't think so because you see the capital gain on shares is on profits, and everybody goes into business to make profits. And uh, you see, this is a sign that uh, you can only pay the capital tax if there is appreciation of the prices of your shares. So it's a good omen, and it will attract a lot of investments into the Nigerian capital market. It is better to even slightly charge the capital market, the capital gain on shares, because 
the capital gain on shares is being treated just like the capital gain on any other assets. So the, the shares are now assumed to be asset like the physical asset. Why? When you dispose an asset and there's a margin of it, you pay capital gain tax. So I don't think the introduction of capital tax on, uh, on shares will discourage investors. Rather, it will uh, encourage investors because which means that a lot of the available profits or the transactions in the capital market that can lead to share appreciation. So I believe that uh, since it is introduced now, let us give it a trial and see what is going to be the response of the market. Because it's a policy of government. All right. And then another thing is uh, we've been having this conversation since last year to see how we can expand you know, the capital markets, uh, for instance, the equities, how do we get more listings? Today, in the equities market, if you have some major stocks for, you see the market deep in the red. You have one or two major stocks. So what are you doing or what do you intend to do to attract more listing into the market? Because this, of course, another way to boost the market to be able to handle what the federal government is expecting it to do. You see, uh, that is the essence of refilling the act. Number one, to provide transparency in the processes in the capital market. You see, companies will be listed in the capital market if there is assurance, there is a confidence that their investment is safe. And uh, so for that reason, uh, we encourage, or the, the act, existing act, will now develop a kind of investor's confidence so that uh, most of the gaps or areas where the uh, violations are discouraged. That is why in the existing acts, we have provided for a lot of uh, uh, penalties and uh, measures that are deterrent, that will discourage some of manipulations that are currently existing in the market. So it is a conf uh, the, 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 the performance of the market, how transparent the market is, how honest and sincere the operators are will encourage the listing in the capital market. So we we'll believe at the end of the day, if the Senate concur on this bill, a lot of things will happen and it will encourage investments and a lot of companies will be listed into the capital market. That is why one of the areas we threaten is the regulatory oversight function of SEC over the quoted companies. Because once the, the shareholders of uh, quoted companies are confident and they have appropriate returns, I believe most of the uh, companies will be listed in the capital market. Yeah, so, uh, yeah just, just before we let you go, because we're almost out of time, uh, we do know in Nigeria we have a lot of policies, we have a lot of bills, you know, but eventually it seems it only ends on paper. As the chairman of this committee, what regulatory framework do you have to ensure that this bill uh, will come into operation and will really make an impact in the capital markets? Well, the bill has already been passed in the House and uh, it, uh, it will be sent to Senate for concurrence. And uh, I can assure you that uh, we are targeting before the end of January uh, the Senate will concur on this bill. And once it is concur on the bill, automatically it only remains the, the endorsement of Mr. President and the bill will come into effect. So I believe that uh, uh, it all depends on the, 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 the presidency and we're appealing to them that uh, once the bill is, is, is concurred by the Senate, they should expedite action on the bill so that at least it will take effect immediately within the first quarter of 2023. All right, uh, Chairman of the House Committee on Capital Markets and Institutions, Honorable Babangida Ibrahim, thank you so much for your time this morning. We're well, looking forward to the well, ascent of the President and then the operational of this uh, very bill. By the grace of God, thank you very much. All right, so we're always looking for ways uh, that budget has to be funded. And if we must have more than 7 trillion naira from the capital market, it means that the capital market has to be ready and strong enough to be able to bring out that amount of money. Let's take a break now. Of course, we are staying on the recent issues. Uh, one good news is uh, consistently for three months now, Nigeria's oil production has been up. So we'll talk about that after the break on the commodity segments. <music>
welcome back. Nigeria's oil production rose to an eight-month high of 1.35 million barrels a day in December. That's according to the latest survey by Bloomberg. The increase lifted total crude output from the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries by 150,000 barrels to 29.14 million barrels a day within the period. Industry experts attribute this new rise in the country's oil output to the federal government's crackdown on oil theft, which include the monitoring in real time of oil infrastructure with the NNPCL's new automated platform, as well as whistleblower scheme against oil thieves in the country. Well, to help us delve into this much more is Bolanle Agbaje, uh, second time this week. Hi, Bolanle. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> so this is good news. It you is. like good news? Yes, I always <laughs> do. I knew, obviously, they were going to crack down on and make sure that they, you know, put their hands on on those, you know, thieves and the oil theft, because it's just not, it's not, it's not good news for Nigeria as a major oil producer in African states. Mm. So I already, we already expected that this was going to happen and hopefully it's going forward from there because we, we are, oil production, you know, a few years back was about 1.8 and we have the capacity to produce up to 2 million barrels per day. So this is welcome news. For and us. of course, that will mean more money for us in our coffers yes. and more dollars, yes. which could help threaten the Naira. Naira. Yes, and also help fund the budget. <laughs> <laughs> and also help fund the budget because yes. we're just talking about how to get more than 7 trillion Naira from capital market this year yes. alone. Yes. Hoping yes. that the capital market can withstand that uh, amount of pressure. But you so the, the, another conversation going on around this is the sustenance of this. We do know that it's costing the federal government a lot of money to employ that private uh, security outfit yes. that, is, that is helping carry out this. All. So, you know, that is on the one hand the expenses of that. And some people are even skeptical that why should the government employ you know, private and security. So, you know, especially in a case where, according to, the, like, the, the standard economic theory, in a case where you feel like the private sector cannot handle certain aspects of the economy, that's when you see the government coming in and making sure that they, they pull things together in order to aid production and, you know, also boost growth from now, obviously, until the short term, medium term, and more or less long term. But um, in actual fact, the uh, Minister of Finance actually mentioned the fact that, you know, the petrol subsidies is, cur is currently on till mid this year and it will be nice if that money is you know translated to this oil private um, employing the private security that the government is doing but it's not the case at the moment and I, obviously I understand where they're coming from I think at the time mid last year where they decided to remove the particular subsidy they got a lot of threats from labor unions and all that and you know trying to be popular and remain popular amongst individuals you know you more or less keep that subsidy in place and it will be nice to see what the new administration does in terms of <laughs> very interesting Balane, honestly because i mean the timing is so interesting we expect there to be a handover by may yes and then by june, june the subsidy yes. regime ends it, <laughs> and the new government is supposed to accommodate that the government that is just coming in will they be able to handle labor and the social uh uh adverse effects effect that, that will come would, out of the yeah, removal it, of the it subsidy. It would be very unpopular for, you know, a new government or a new administration to more or less take that out and, you know, because the in immediate if impact of that on ev most individuals in the economy would everybody, be very harsh. I think everybody will feel it. Yes, but the, but the truth about it is, I think it's better to just, you know, do away with the subsidies and let the economy just find its balance in the near term. If we had done this a while ago, we would, we, we, we would probably be in a better place at the moment, but um, it's not the case Although, you know, the Minister of Finance kept, kept talking about the fact that non-oil revenue had increased by or is expected to even increase by about 78%. And that's what the budget is supposed to be funded by. And oil revenue is about 22%. So it would be nice to see that, you know, in reality. Although we do know that agriculture contributed about 30% to the last um, GDP figures that we saw. So um, it's, it's great news for us. But in, in reality, it means that it's not just about having the commodities and, you know, being buoyant with those commodities. It's about the operations and making them efficient and generating the amount of revenue that... Because the potential is ridiculous hmm. for Nigeria. You mentioned potential in Nigeria. 
<laughs> no, it's just everybody just go because we have so much potential, but it do. still remains a potential, you know, and that's that can be discouraging that you have the potential and you cannot develop that potential. Yeah. You know, but when when you talk about um funding the budget from oil, like I think in in twenty twenty in twenty twenty two it was pegged at sixty five dollars. Mm -hmm. But this year now we, we could go back to that conversation of the excess crude. Yes, yes. But um, right now, oil prices are currently trading at about $78. Mm -hmm. And I think the benchmark is pegged at 75 So it's it's a big risk for us right there. Um, but I, we're really hopeful that oil prices would, you know, continue to increase. And although we're seeing this, you know, destabilizing yeah, with the prices China, just because we'll of see China. The weather. But I do know that, you know, major oil producing countries like Saudi, they would more or less not produce as much to make sure that prices you know remain at you know high levels for us but um it, it calls to question what prices are trading at now and what the benchmark was released yesterday so mm -hmm. um it's it's a it's a very i think you know, that tricky. benchmark is really is is, is kind of risky it what is if the war ends today um, so if the war ends, it'll actually be good news for us because it means that all countries will just, you know, go back to what they used to do, you know, in the past. But what few will years. happen to oil prices? So it, it it would either it would most likely, you know, go up because you know that positive news would filter into most not just oil price, most commodity prices because the the, the major reason why we're seeing all these situations with commodity prices because Russia and you know Ukraine, Ukraine. started whatever you know happened between the two of them and um, that already you. you you had seen this boom and bust cycle with commodity prices, a case where either they, you know, they go up as high as what we've never seen before or they drop down, you know, significantly. So if, you know, you should see a situation where Russia actually stops the war today, mm -hmm. and I'm definitely sure that, you know, most of those countries can get back to business as usual and produce the way they used to and prices can actually regulate and in the market. And then uh, we'll have to also deal with the COVID situation in China. Yes, also it's, it's very unfortunate. <laughs> and also I think what's happened with oil prices yesterday was the fact that the IMF, you know, mentioned um, the, the, the fact that, you know, the recession is here to stay, actually for one third of the world economy. And also the fact that, you know, the COVID, increasing COVID cases in China is going to be, is going yeah. to be harsh. We've on, seen, uh, 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 there, are some, there are some new countries now that are beginning to introduce restrictions for yes, China. Yes, Ghana China. is one of them that also um, released this. getting closer home yes, now. Yes, it is. And I, oh, I did see a report about COVID cases in Nigeria as well. Yeah. Yes. So, you know, there's that talk coming up with COVID again. And it, it's, it's like COVID is just here to stay. And it's, it's best to just find and adjust to the new normal around you. Well, we hope China can because they're affecting oil prices and every other thing I, in I'm the sure world. I'm sure it's a strategy for them to, you know, because the protests were there, open up the economy. We've been but closed down But they're, they're so turning long. it political. I don't know if you've seen that now. The Chinese government is saying restriction on China or Chinese travelers is political. And I'm like... Countries are just trying to protect themselves. Exactly, and prevent what we had seen in, in 2020. 2020. Yes. So um, I, I, it, it might be it might be both because there must be there, there must be some signs that you know the Chinese government is seeing and making sure that they you know uh, put that news out there for individuals to also not stop business with China as usual. <laughs> okay, all right. Uh, so um, we see the price of gas also. Yes, it has, you know, dropped by about 50%. And That's it's due lot. to, it's a lot. It's good in any sense, but it's not good for our country because we're major producers. But um, in the sense that the milder weathers that we had seen um, from now, obviously going forward, had also reduced demand. demand. And, you know, before that, you had seen a lot of European countries build inventory. But um, there's this particular risk towards the end of the year where they build again for the 2023 to 2024 um, year. So it must mean that prices would increase, you know, towards the end of the year as well. But in actual fact, you know, you have analysts that have mentioned the fact that it's great news for us and it's also good for inflation as well. So yeah. it's inflation numbers would most likely inch downwards too. Hmm. It would be good to see Nigerian inflation <laughs> each down. We, our, our forecast is that, you know, by the end of this year, we should see inflation at about 17%, we hope. Um, and it, th that's our positive expectations. Yeah, well, I wonder. Because even the UK yesterday, their inflation, December inflation, food inflation, though, the general inflation, I think, tapered. Yeah. But the food inflation did not give yeah, any Yeah, but, you sign. know, you, Europe, actually, most European countries are major consuming countries. So they would, whatever is happening with pr commodities, especially around 
around the world would be felt deeply with, with, within those um, countries in mm. Europe. So what else is going on with the agricultural um, With the agricultural space, Tanzania is, is one that we need to learn from. You know, gold is one of their major, I think it contributes about 47% to their um, GDP and um, we have seen prices increase by about 17%, which is great for them. And I think gold production had increased also to, for, to about 17,500 grams. So that's great. And it's, it would be nice to learn from, you know, countries like that. Cocoa prices in Nigeria has actually increased as well in Ondo, Ogun, and um, Oshun, and even Cross River as well. You've seen cocoa prices trade at about $4,000, which is good for us. And um, the, I think what is making the effect even more is the fact that, you know, the depreciating Naira, because obviously when you convert that into dollars is, is, is more for us. So um, that's great news for us. And it also contributes to uh, what the expectations of the budget is, according to the minister. <laughs> yeah, but uh, it will also be nice to have more states, yeah, you know, because we do have the potential no, in other states. Other states are, you know, buoyant with other types of commodities. So it would be nice to talk about other commodities that Nigeria could also benefit from as, uh, as much as, you know, we're benefiting from cocoa mm -hmm. and oil. So the harvest season, is it over? Um, yes, it's over. So we're, we're entering the planting season and um, it will be good to, you know, what we're praying for actually is, 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 is the weather that would actually contribute to, and also funding in that space. And then towards the mid of the year, we go into our, you know, harvest season again. So that is something to watch out for. Although commodity, domestic commodity prices, we're seeing a lot of commodity prices inch downwards. And I think it's the usual trend from the December period yeah. when you from get into, peak. from the peak period. So mm. when you get into the beginning mm. of the new year, there's this balancing out of, you know, commodity prices. Mm. Well, I remember a statement by LCCI recently saying that, I mean, for us to survive this year and maybe maintain some sort of growth, yeah. the government interventions must be consistent. It has. It yeah, has but, to. Yes. Yeah, because the private sector has been hit so bad. And, you know, they're still talking about taxes and increasing taxes, which is also going to put more pressure on uh, private individuals. So right now is where, and it's the same trend all around the world, where you see government officials coming in to, you know, intervene in, and, and, and make sure that, you know, the economy stays as stable as, and as sustainable as it can, as it can be. Mm. Well, thank you so much, Belani. But we do pray for miracles, especially mm -hmm. from the non oil exports yes. this year. It would yes. really be nice, you know, to have buffer from that and era. also benefit from the AFCTA situation. Well, yeah. Because we are two years yes, this year. We are. We are. <laughs> we are and I don't think we've, we've been able to benefit, you know, from that so far. Mm. All right. Thank you so much for, thank you for having me. Your optimism as usual <laughs> and uh, your contribution to the program this morning. Thank you. All right. Okay, from the commodities market, we will certainly be going to another market where Will Ebon will join us for that. Uh, but uh, as Bolanle has said, it will be interesting to see more from the non-oil export. We know that uh, we expect about 7 trillion naira coming from the capital market. So Will should tell us uh, where that uh, 7.04 trillion naira will be coming from Will. Uh, we're expecting more than 7 trillion naira <laughs> from the capital market, market this year oh, I, to cover up for the more than 11 trillion naira deficits in 2023 budget. Will, you have a lot of work to do. I, I do. But too much pressure, Ini. So much pressure. <laughs> and we just have how many companies listed on the exchanges, Ini? Well, we just spoke to the take chairman. Take it easy. Of the take it easy. He says we're working on getting more listings. Okay. He's working now. We're oh, he's <laughs> working on getting more listings. So you work on getting them. <laughs> I work in the seven trillion. Yes. And it will, right now we're seeing so much activity in the market, this bullish sentiment. And I'm thinking we're probably going to hit that and more. Let's just ah, keep our right. fingers crossed. Great, good news. <laughs> so yesterday, the local boss extended Tuesday's positive performance. And this was driven by investors' interest in Nigerian brews, which was up 10% yesterday. We saw the all share index inch higher by 0.12% to close at 51,567 points. And this is going higher. We're getting closer to the 52,000 level there. And now we are still at the 28. 
trillion naira mark there. But yet to date return is now at 0 0.8 percent. This is a high we're running and we'll keep going. Probably will be at 10 percent anytime soon. Now, total volume of trade declined by 17.4 percent to 265.72 million. That was the only downer in yesterday's uh, trading activity. We saw value at 13.53 billion naira. That's a huge one. Very, very lots of monies rolling out in the exchange yesterday and it was in over 4,156 deals. Now we saw what cement was the most traded stock by volume yesterday. It's really boosted the market's performance. Its value was at 101.65 million units um, traded and 9.85 billion naira. That was the value of that uh, unit that was traded in yesterday's trading session. Now we saw sectoral performance was mixed. We saw consumers, uh, goods, uh, insurance was up, uh, banking up. Uh, oil and gas was, you know, flat as well. Uh, well but we had what cement in top trades, as I mentioned earlier, Transco actually holdings they were the ones that you know investors were trading a lot of well, the volume of the stocks with a lot in yesterday's trading transaction now looking at the market breadth we're still having a positive market breadth and uh, we saw the top gainers for yesterday um Nigerian breweries at 10 percent yesterday we saw uh, um, the NACO as a national aviation holding company at 10 percent also up this stock is really um on the move and investors should look out for that stock now living trust is also up 10 percent in yesterday's trading session let's look at the losers for yesterday's trading session we saw um if we have the losers in yesterday's trading session champion breweries was down 10 percent unity bank 6.78 percent and uba lost 3.61% in yesterday's trading session. But we're going to talk to Oluwashi Ondosumo. He's the head research investment at Parsian Securities. Give us more insights as to what the market will bring and what should we, we should be expecting today. Good morning, Shane. It's good to have you on the program. Hi, Will. Good morning. Good to be here. Uh, Sheon, we hit the 52, we're, oh well, we have not hit the 52,000 level. We're almost at the 52,000 level. It's not far from sight now, is it? No, it's not. It's not. <laughs> so um, one of the interesting things about the market I've observed in the last couple of weeks and even towards the end of last year was the fact that despite the hike in interest rate, uh, we saw that November and um, the market performance for November and December was positive. Now, um, a lot of people have been asking questions. What's driving the market? We know um, there been a, there's been a hike in interest rate. We've seen yields in the fixed income market. However, one thing that um, people have not been paying attention to is the fact that inflation has been on the uptrend. So <laughs> investors right now are looking for how they can narrow, you know, that that gap between their real returns and um, inflation. So um, we, we saw that the last um, Nigerian Treasury bills auction that happened last year yields settled at 8.5%. Uh, which means that if inflation is at um, 21.5, um, you get the yields in the treasury bill space is at um, 8.5. You have that gap of 13%. You still need to cover because um, inflation is still ravaging um, investors' um, funds. So the equities market is still the place that will give you that kind of return in a short period of time. So we've seen that um, investors have been chasing dividend yields. Smart investors have started positioning since November. We've seen that move, uh, whereby, you know, November closing the positive, you know, um, from June to last year, the market has been negative. However, for November, December, the market closing the positive. Uh, to some people, they say that um, Santa came early <laughs> last year, especially for December. But looking forward, one interesting thing I, um, we observed in the market is the fact that every election year, the market actually closes in the negative. However, for this year, the narrative is different. <laughs> now, let me just um, take you back a little bit, then bring you back forward. Uh, historically, we know that um, our market is largely driven by foreign investors. Foreign investors largely move our market. So we decided to look at what happened in the last election um, in 2019. We saw that for January, February, March, foreign investors were actually um, taking a sizable um, position in the market. They were, they were the major movers of the market um, to the tune of about 55% in January, 53% um, in February, and 50% um, as of March. However, since the last quarter of 2019, our market has been largely driven by domestic players. I mean, obviously, 
where would they run to? <laughs> Nowhere. They are here. So um, foreign investors haven't been coming to our market the way they have in previous years, and that's because of our exchange rate volatility and um, the effect illiquidity, because sometimes they come into our market at a particular rate, and it's hard for them to live at that same rate. Mm. And there's no indication as to what rate they will live at. So they've been, they've been away from our market. And we can also see that that also influenced our market last year because our market was, in a way, immune from the um, issues in the global space in terms of the Russian-Ukraine war. Anyway, moving forward, <laughs> now that we have that in the back of our minds that our, our, our market is largely driven by domestic players, um, we've seen that, you know, historically, January has closed in the positive for the last five years except 2019. And that was because, you know, the market was largely driven by foreign players. But now that the market is driven by domestic players, we we are optimistic that this month, January might still close in the positive. Now, why am I saying that? First of all, we have inflation that we need to worry about. Secondly, the corporate earnings, um, the company's corporate earnings have been very good. I mean, the third quarter results have been fantastic. Between um, 70 and 83%, of the companies that have released their results have posted good numbers, numbers that are better than what they did even for the full year of 2021. Okay. So their numbers are good, which okay. um, implies okay. that the, their dividend payout w- would also like be likely, you know, w- might be likely better than what they've done in previous years. So sure. Also, we need to also look at the yields in the fixed income market. The, so- like I mentioned earlier, the, the um, last Nigerian Treasury bills option Yields settled at 8.5 percent. I mean, before now, yields have been much higher. We saw that from um, when the CBN hiked interest rates from 11 from 11.5 percent to 13 percent, and all the way to 16.5. Uh, we saw that investors were moving to safer havens uh, because you know we had that concern about the elections, macroeconomic numbers were not looking good, okay. but. So now, show, investors show, are more, what, what, what you're just telling us generally is to expect uh, more growth, uh, more uh, positive performance for the equities market, looking at what's happening in the fixed income market right now, where yields are actually trending downwards. We're going to expect more um, inflow, especially with the Q4 earnings coming in, if Q3 earnings was fantastic. So we'll look forward to that, and we'll look forward to a good close in today's trading session. Thank you so much, Chung Dosimu, Head Thank Research you. Investment uh, Party and Securities, for joining us on today's program. So, Ine, that's how the market is going. Yeah, well, well, looking at for Shell the, had a lot to he say. He did have a lot to I say. I guess have to bring him up. Well, uh, bring you know, back and, to the and he, he definitely yeah. had a lot to say. And I'm looking at it. It's actually right. Today is, we're in the election year, and we're still in the positive, Ine. Still in the positive. Well, he said that the last election year ended negative. Oh, we are in the election year. <laughs> okay, we, so, we, 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 so we have. I, I, have I, I am seeing we a have positive. Eleven months. <laughs> I am seeing a positive close. <laughs> All right, Will. Thank you so much. Uh, let's switch over to London now, where Juliana has been standing by. Juliana, good morning, uh, and good to have you on the show. I don't know how good to say though, because. Uh, we see that uh, Christmas grocery spending reached a new high, but not because the volume was high. Unfortunately, it was because the prices were high. Yeah, that's absolutely right. Good morning, Innie. We're on day five of January, and finally, we've got a little bit of good news uh, for investors in the UK, and that's because Cantor, uh, which is um, a retail forensic consultancy site, they have released data looking at just how much was spent during um, the Christmas period, and £12.8 billion was spent by consumers in the UK despite the cost of living crisis. This is a 9.4% year-on-year high, one of the highest uh, sales uh, figures on record. So that is good. But as you said, of course, all you need to do is scratch beneath the surface to reveal the true uh, picture. And we can see that volumes did fall. They only fell slightly, though, by 1%. And that's because people had to spend because things cost more. I think really economists are looking at this in one way. And that's the fact that, you know, we had two years of a pandemic Christmas last year. Well, 
2021 was supposed to be much brighter until the onset of Omicron. Lots of non-essential retailers were forced to shut their doors just days uh, before Christmas. So I think even though people didn't have as much money in their back pocket as they had this time last year, they were determined to make Christmas even brighter, which is why they spent so much money. Um, as to be expected, all the big four um, uh, grocers here in the UK, so that's Tesco, Audi, you know, Tesco, Morrison, Sainsbury's and Asda, they did particularly well. Next as well, that managed to weather the storm of the pandemic. They've done exceptionally well too. So some of the cheer that we see on the blue chip index today has certainly been lifted uh, by investors uh, putting their money into grocers this morning. Yeah, but uh, not starting uh, on a good note uh, the year, I mean, for Prime Minister Rishi Sunak, as we see uh, foreign investors selling off their bonds. Yeah, this is an interesting story, um, but it's backdated. This is looking at the 12 weeks to the end of November. So that covers that pretty tumultuous period uh, where Liz Truss's six weeks tenure uh, caused a riot in the markets and it left uh, gilts at their lowest level that we've seen in decades. Uh, that was one of the reasons why the Bank of England had to uh, partake in an emergency measure to buy long-term gilts to make sure uh, that the, the stability and the credibility of Britain's current account could continue. So between the 12 weeks uh, to November, I believe like £38.4 billion pounds worth of gilts, which is basically government bonds, government debt, uh, was sold off. So it's not great. Um, again, this is a forensic look. We're looking in the rearview mirror, so we're not sure uh, whether or not Jeremy Hunt, the Chancellor, the new Chancellor, after uh, Kwasi Kwarteng was ousted, uh, was able to restore uh, the trust in Britain. We shall just have to wait and see. But I think as uh, the weeks go on and we start looking at data for Q2, Q3 of, um, you know, Britain last year, we will start to see just how uh, negative that ripple effect of trustonomics had in uh, Britain's global standing. Certainly, uh, Julian, I will certainly be keeping our eyes on those numbers and trust you to bring them to us. So we'll talk to you at 1.30. Thank you for your time this morning. Talk to you then. Thank you. All right. So let's see how the crypto space is doing this morning with Laddie Williams. Hi, Laddie. Morning, Yeni. Yeah, Good morning. seen some action, you know, with uh, Bitcoin there. You're smiling. Some... I expect yeah. Bitcoin is back to 60,000. No, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> Still far away. But we're, we're seeing some, you know, small movements here and there. Looking like some volatility is coming because Bitcoin is oversold on all time frames. So, hmm. It, it, who knows? Can it go lower? That is the question. Can it go lower? Have we hit the bottom yet? That is the question the every investor question. is looking for. And you know, mm -hmm. we got the Fed minutes, you know, yesterday. And obviously, investors looking for direction. Is the Fed still going to raise rates? And the Fed is saying they will keep raising rates as Until long as inflation, inflation is high. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, we're still uh, seeing fear in the market. 29 points, uh, fear greed index sentiment, uh, showing investor sentiment in the market right now. Let's look at the market cap this morning, $819 uh, billion. Uh, getting deeper uh, above the $800 billion level. We did lose that level in 2022, but seem to be getting back up uh, above that. Uh, volume traded up 3.60%. We see Bitcoin dominance still tamed. 39.50%. Let's look at the price of Bitcoin now, $16,830. It's now 0.24%. A minor pullback there, but it did start an upward correction. Did hit a resistance at 16,900. We still have another resistance at 17,000 dollars, and uh, obviously we see Bitcoin trying to uh, break above those levels. And see Ethereum there, 1,251 dollars, still holding above that 1,200 dollar level since 2022, holding it strong. Volume traded 5.16 uh, billion dollars. Let's look at the top of the market cap now. We see it's uh, squarely mixed there. With Binance token uh, up 1.17 percent, 257 dollars, and we see XRP 34 cents uh, breaking uh, that bullish run it did start in 2022. It's down 0.85 percent. Let's see if we have our Rume Ofi now, financial market analyst. Hello, Rume. Good morning, Larry. Good morning. Good, good morning, uh, Rume. I don't know. We've, we've not seen in 2023, I believe. Uh, so happy, happy New Year. Happy New Year, Daddy. Happy New Year, happy Rume. New Year. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it, it seems the issues from 2022, you know, still weighing on in the, on the crypto market. Obviously, the FTX contagion, and now we're seeing uh, Genesis and and DCG, both heavyweights in the crypto market, at uh, each other's throats. What's going on? 
uh, that is, uh, what is happening in the market as a result of FTA is a big blow. A, a couple of persons are actually thinking that we are done with all of this, but uh, we are not done yet. Uh, yesterday, uh, the DOJ, the Department of Justice in the U.S., actually uh, held uh, 56 million uh, shares for Robin Hood. That's going to actually also affect the market. Uh, because of FTX, because FTX actually owns those shares. Then uh, for DCG, which is Digital Currency Group, and uh, Gemini. Gemini is this platform uh, owned by the Wink Levels twins, uh, Come, Come On, and uh, Come On Wink Levels and the brother, uh, as well as the actually the there's this earning platform in that uh, Genesis provided. Uh, Genesis is owned by the parent company uh, DCG, owned by Barry Silver and a couple of other companies like. Coindesk, and as well as Grayscale. You know, so this platform gives yield, and this yield that people from uh, Genesis and um, Gemini actually did with uh, Genesis could not get their money back from the. There's an open letter that uh, Wink Level Twins, what the CEO actually wrote to uh, DCG uh, uh, owner Barry Silver, but. They are not yet uh, having their money back. And this is not a small money. I'm counting to about $1.64 billion of uh, customers' funds, actually with Genesis. And uh, the body language of Barry Silver is not helping matters, which actually prompt this uh, owner of Gemini to write uh, an open letter, giving it up, him up to about January 8th. I don't know. Hopefully, all of these things are not good for the space. It's going to make... Uh, people, investors, to be scared of scared of investing. From the later, if you read the open letter, you know that people, uh, teachers' money are there. Uh, people that have invested some huge amounts of their life savings actually there. You yeah, know how to draw because of that. Is right, difficult. Rume. Yeah, definitely, a definitely a big one, uh, Rume. But but do you think uh, this is the next implosion to look out for in 2023 between these two heavyweights? It has started already. Holding somebody's money down $1.6 billion is enough to skyrocket everything again from, from the beginning. And it's not good for this. All right, if I'm right an right. investor, I will invest now. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure that's why there's so much fear in this market right now, from extreme fear to fear, back to extreme fear again. But let's uh, see how that all uh, plays out in 2023. Thank you so much, uh, Rume Ofi, financial market much. analyst. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, my buddy. All right, now, so let's look at the uh, top gainers this morning. We see uh, eCash shopping that counter there is up 10.28%. And we see uh, Chili's token there, uh, the fan token for, uh, for sports, there's up 9.18%. Ethereum Classic, one of the oldies, up 8.21%. And we see Near Protocol on the gainers counter, $1.58, up 7.43%. Uh, uh, and if you see, flip over there, we see Huobi token there, uh, the uh, exchange, centralized exchange token uh, for the Huobi exchange down 12.06%, double-digit losses for that uh, uh, token right there. So in it's uh, still fair uh, in the market, but there, there's some, uh, we know something is about to happen in this market. <laughs> we just don't know. We're afraid. We just don't know which direction. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I think we're just tired of being afraid. Uh, yeah. Now we want some green in the market. Yeah. Let's see anything other than Fear green. on every market yes. except the NGS. Except the NGS. Yeah. I'm too proud to be a Nigerian. Of course I am. At least for that. <laughs> Thank you so much. All right. <laughs> All right. So that's it on the program this morning. Uh, the week, the, the year I meant to say is, is getting old already. So we're settling into doing business. And this is the way it's going to be, God's grace. Uh, so uh, let's do this again tomorrow. But I'll see you at 10 p.m. when I'll bring you the stock market report. Willie Bong... Uh, Ladi Williams will be back here at 1.30 with Business Incorporated. So in case uh, anything came up between now and then, you get it on Business Incorporated. I'll see you at 10 p.m. and 10 a.m. tomorrow. I'm Ini John Mekwa. See, see you.